Okay, uh, so today I'm going to be talking about ecosystem response to the removal of the Elwha River dams. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge there's too many people to list, um, and this is just a smattering of the groups that are involved in the uh, Elwha River dam removal and the monitoring of it. So I just want to acknowledge all the different folks that have been working on this. Um, we'll just start a little bit with the location. The Elwha is located on Washington's Olympic Peninsula. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, the majority of the watershed it is, is in Olympic National Park. It drains north to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. It has a drainage area of a little over 800 square kilometers and um, over 70 kilometers of main stem habitat and at least 30 to 50 kilometers of tributary habitat. Um, and it's a typical Western Washington uh, watershed. One thing I will note is that there's a series of alluvial valleys denoted uh, in the dark on the map, as well as those canyon reaches denoted in the white. You have your usual suspects in terms of salmonids in the Elwha. We actually have all of them, and, um, and non-salmonids as well, including Ulicon and Pacific Lamprey. And the purpose of the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Act was basically for the removal of the dams and full restoration of the ecosystem and the native anadromous fishes. In terms of the hypotheses associated with this restoration action, they're pretty basic, that the dam removal would result in fish passage to the Elwha River. 90% of it was inaccessible to anadromy, and with dam removal, we would see that change. Another basic hypothesis was that the restored sediment dynamics would result in the creation and maintenance of existing habitats in the, in the riverine system, as well as lost habitats such as the estuary. And this is just a photograph of what the uh, estuary looks like now on the uh, on, on your on my left I guess you're right um, and then that the restored connectivity for fish and uh, sediment would lead to changes in the riverine food web terrestrial languages and revegetation and this is just uh, some conceptual models that we uh, that we recently uh, uh, got accepted as, as part of a paper uh, in bioscience to give you an idea of how we're thinking about what's going on above dams as well as below dams. So in terms of the overall study design, it really was a function of two things. One was the location of the different habitats, the dams in the former reservoir areas, the near shore, and the riverine system, and then the processes associated, primarily the sediment dynamics and the fish recolonization and how they would affect the riverine food web, the terrestrial linkages, and the revegetation. So when we get into more detail, if we think about things in terms of adult fish, juvenile fish, food webs, habitat, sediment, and riparian, we had a variety of different experimental designs, um, uh, before or after, before or after control impact, um, a variety of different spatial designs. Most of it was essentially stratified systematic surveys or opportunistic and again, a variety of different temporal designs. And that really was a function of what we were trying to get at with more specific questions. But really, a couple of the key points to remember is that there was, the spatial extent was really critical for what we were doing, and that changes over time as a function of the restoration action. There is a need to quantify that natural verse treatment variability, which we all kind of struggle with. And we tried to do an annual analysis of the information. One of the biggest questions that we had to tackle was what was going to happen to all the sediment. There was over 20 million cubic meters of sediment accumulated in the reservoirs. Most of it was fine sediment. Over half of it was predicted to erode downstream. And there were a variety of different predictions associated with it, really high suspended sediment concentrations, a temporary deposition of fines and pools, a more dynamic floodplain connection with the main river, the bed building up, and a beach formation in the estuary. So in terms of the restoration action, the Elwha River Dam, which was located at River Kilometer 8, was over 100 feet high and had a little less than 5 million cubic meters of sediment associated with it. Most of that was silt and clay. And basically what they did with the, with the dam removal, well, this is what it looked like in September of 2011, is that they built the coffer dam upstream and they shunted the river to one side of the valley versus the other and then they would deconstruct and then they would do the same again, um, move it over and then and then deconstruct. And then by April of 2012, this was actually done, and this is what it looked like in August of 2012. So that whole process started in September of 2011. 
The Glides Canyon Dam, which was at River Kilometer 22, and both of these, again, no fish passage, was a, was a different story. This one was over 200 feet in height and held over 15 million cubic meters of sediment, most of that being sand and gravel. And what they basically did with this is they took a 2,000 pound jackhammer and put it on a floating barge and went back and forth across the face, knocking the dam down a couple feet every day. And that was all OSHA approved, mind you. So uh, <laughs> um, eventually uh, they couldn't float the barge anymore and they had to bring equipment in for deconstruction. And towards the end, they got the dam down to let's say 30 or 40 feet and then they detonated. Um, Got to show something like this if you're talking about a dam removal. Um, and this is what it would look like on the ground as you're looking upstream um, on your right there and overhead. So really, the majority of the talk is what I'm, uh, what has occurred with the removal of the dams. Again, I'm going to talk about it as a function of location and processes. I'll start with the sediment dynamics. Um, so what we have on the right is basically topographic change maps, blue being deposition, red being erosion. So the most active sediment supply changes occurred between water year 2011 and 13. And in 2011 and 12, sediment was redeposited in the former reservoirs. And the majority of the ex of sediment that was exported happened between 12 and 13 when over eight, mil eight metric tons of sediment was moved out primarily from Mills Reservoir. So over about 65% of the initial sediment that was stored has been exported up to this point. So there's been a variety of different effects downstream. So I'm going to walk you through the menagerie of graphs there on the right. So basically, if you focus on um, the uh, suspended sediment concentration graph, which is the one in brown, the peak sediment concentration that occurred uh, was water year 2013 when former mills basically became a river. So when that reservoir was accessible to the river, that's when basically bed low material was mobilized. And what that resulted in, if you look at the yellow bar there, is that's when we had the largest contribution of sediment relative to the natural background rate. And that's also when the river really started to change. So that's when we had a smoothing effect of all the pools being filled, the bed started to abrade, and the braiding of the river actually increased. But an important point, a lot of this happened with no flows. In other words, no big flows. There were still seasonal flows, but we didn't get a, a large flow event between 2012 and 14 that was greater than the two-year recurrence interval. After that, when we started to get the flow events, that's when we saw sinuosity change. And you can see the circle that just popped up there. So it's kind of an interesting story is that a lot of the work that the river did with sediment was a function of spring snowmelt. Um, we saw the, the most dramatic change was the estuary where we had expansion of the river mouth um, and the majority of that sediment consisted of sand and gravel and the deposition occurred up to 12 meters deep and then about two kilometers east of the river mouth. So you can kind of see and that's where the kind of the long shore drift actually goes in the strait. So we had a prograding delta. These red lines denote where the river was in different, at different years. So in sum, from the sediment perspective, we had over 20 metric tons of sediment released from the reservoirs, most of it from mills. 10% of that deposited in the main river itself and the and associated floodplain channels, but the vast majority of it went out into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and a good portion of it basically created the coastal delta or the estuarine environment that we see there today. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the areas between the dams, the middle Elwha and the upper Elwha, and particularly just salmon response, and go highlight a couple of these points here that we have in terms of adult returns, small doubt migration, sediment impacts, and um, uh, some other things as well. So one of the challenges that we had is there's a variety of different techniques you can use that would actually allow you to enumerate adult salmon. And one of the challenges that we had is um, with the turbidity, we couldn't really see anything. So we, we went to sonar, and we actually have two sonars working in the lower river at River Kilometer 2. And um, they've worked out quite well. And I can go into some detail about those with you uh, later. Um, but uh, basically, this is what we've seen since dam removal in terms of Chinook and Steelhead, in terms of estimates over time. So basically the range somewhere between 2,000 and 4,500 4, um, up to maybe 5,000 Chinook per year. For steelhead, 
we've seen a slight, we've seen an increase going from hundreds to basically about a thousand, a little over a thousand. And the uh, far right are just basically, I wouldn't call them estimates at this point, it's just anecdotal um, information on how we're, what we're getting with the analysis at this point, um, but those aren't finalized yet. In terms of juveniles, we're using the same kind of met, uh, methods that everybody else is using, uh, small traps or screw traps, and the summer population estimates of snorkeling. And just to kind of give you a little bit of information, this is where the screw traps are in this really elaborate uh, graph here. Um, so the lower river and the main stem, and then two tributaries, Indian Creek and Little River, and I'll go into those in a little more detail. Um, we've been doing those since 2012 and 13. And this just gives you an idea of what we've seen over time in, in, uh, in, uh, for steelhead smolts. Um, you can see that we have a pretty low number between 20, in 2014 and 2015. That's when we were still seeing some of the sediment impacts. As those sediment impacts decreased, we actually started seeing uh, quite a few more fish. Um, and so this is just one way to kind of think about those sediment impacts during dam removal. The gray bars denote suspended sediment concentrations, and the orange and blue kind of uh, bars are telling us when fish are kind of out migrating as uh, juveniles, which is the orange, bar, orange bars and blue bars are when Chinook are coming back in. But if you go to the lower graph, that gives you an idea that there has been some impact from the sediment, particularly for actually chum and pink, but not necessarily as much for Chinook salmon and some of the other species. So the recolonization in the middle river between the dams is really a function of natural recolonization and relocation. So there was relocation during dam removal of hatchery and wild adult co of, uh, coho salmon as well as steelhead. And there has been natural recolonization of those as well as other species. Um, and I'll give you some of the results of that. So there was a uh, substantial effort um, to move uh, adult coho during dam removal to these spots, sites denoted in the, in the black dots, the water flowing from the bottom to the top. Um, and there was a Floyd tag uh, study basically done during that time to get an idea of how many fish we were seeing that we moved versus what was getting up there naturally. So for coho, you can see in each of the years, the majority of the fish up to 2015 that we saw were fish we actually moved um, to, to spawning grounds in the middle elbow. But you can see in 2016 and 17, and I don't have the data for 2017, 18, but it's the same thing. That's when we actually started to see fish that we weren't tagged. So in other words, fish that were returning from um, fish that were actually, that, that where they were spawned from. And we also saw an immediate uh, uh, change in terms of, uh, you, uh, how do I put this? Um, we saw an environmental effect in terms of life history. So what we have is two streams coming in roughly in the same location in the river system, one Indian Creek being a low gradient wetland dominated system, and the other one Little River being a steep gradient snowmelt channel. Well, one is a lot colder than the other, so Little River is a lot colder, and there's a two month growth advantage assuming that you, you have like optimal growth above nine degrees C for juvenile salmon. So basically there's an eight week window where we see better conditions for juvenile coho and other species in Indian Creek. And as a result of that, what we've seen is that while both systems produce coho fry, um, and a lot, a lot more are produced in Little River, and a lot more smolts are produced out of Indian Creek. And that's basically with fish of the same genetics, same basic numbers in each of the systems. So we're seeing some kind of phenotypic responses basically to the environmental conditions and differences in life history strategy. There was also uh, natural and assisted recolonization for steelhead. This is the number of steelhead that were relocated to primarily Little River in particular. Um, and what we've seen with steelhead is basically a shift from the lower river in particular to the middle. And now we're starting to see fish in the upper river as well above both of the dams. So this is just an example of that as a function of time with the dam removal. For Chinook, we've seen natural recolonization in the middle river. There were no fish moved there, and we saw an immediate response uh, to those guys in terms of um, uh, opening up that habitat between the dams in 2012 and then the upper dam uh, recently. So overall, we've seen somewhere between 200 and almost 1,000 reds between and above the dams. Now, the other thing that we've also identified is the fact that we're seeing other species, such as Pacific lamprey, and this is just from Indian Creek, uh, 
gives you an idea that we're seeing an increase not only in adults Pacific lamprey, um, but but they're basically macrothalmia and amethyst, which is a, a very positive sign. We've had issues associated with the dam removal. Um, a massive rock fall, you can see the rock fall deposit on the left and on the right the photo uh, basically showing you what it was historically, which caused a barrier. Uh, this was uh, in 2014. Um, back in 2015 of October, uh, those rocks were detonated um, to allow fish passage. And that's what it looked like on the far right post rock fall. Now, it's important because there's a lot of habitat above uh, over, you know, I think it's over 70 kilometers of habitat above uh, glines that needed to be opened up. And one of the more positive things that we've seen is summer steelhead observations over the last, particularly the last three years, where we've gone from about five fish to over 200 fish in that area circled on the right. Um, and these are fish that are coming in somewhere between May and October. Um, so they are true summer steelhead. In terms of the benthic food web response, um, there's been um, a lot of work done on that by Sarah Morley and Jeff Duda, where we've seen physical habitat changes and then monitored what's gone on in terms of primary production, secondary production, and, and the diet. And there we have a study design of between, below, and above the dams. Um, and I'm just going to talk about basically between and below the dams. So what, we, what we've seen with benthic inverts is we've seen a we saw a, a decrease, a dramatic decrease in the density of inverts during dam removal between 2012 and 14, followed by a pretty dramatic increase uh, post dam removal in terms of their densities and seeing that species composition shift. Between the dams, it was a little bit different. We didn't see as much of a drop and we haven't seen as much of a increase and we're not back to the before levels yet. For diet, I wanna just um, point out to you the upper graph, we really just focus on that below the dams. What we saw was that during the sediment, um, we saw a, a dramatic, change from the um, terrestrial, from the aquatic to the terrestrial in terms of their, of what their fish were eating and then shifting back again. It looks like I'm going to go over time. Do I got a couple minutes? Is that okay? One more minute after that? Is that okay? Okay. Are we saying anything? I guess I do. So anyway, um, so anyway, uh, in terms of terrestrial linkages, this is probably one of the more interesting work uh, studies done on uh, in the Elwha with Chris Tonner from Ohio State University, where he looked at American dippers in areas in the yellow below an address, or areas below barriers, and then in the red above barriers. And what he found was that when you opened up those barriers, we actually saw a shift in marine derived nutrients associated with these dippers. So we actually saw a signal in them. And not only did we see a signal in them, but he actually documented better condition factors for the females, higher survival rate, and 20 times more likelihood of having attempt to multiple broods. So for the revegetation, um, there was a plan in place by the tribe, the Lower Elwha tribe and the National Park Service. Um, and kind of the hypothesis here was that basically the most important variables that would be associated with excessive revegetation would be moisture, sediment texture, distance from the forest. And Josh Chenoweth did some studies out there looking at the fine sediments and coarse sediments. And basically the take home message was that the fine sediments, we have vegetation thriving and the coarse sediments, um, not so much. And this just gives you an example of that if you look to the far right in the coarse and the fine. So in summary, the dams came down, over half of the sediment has been mobilized. We're seeing revegetation better in the fine sediments than the coarse sediments. Most of the sediment actually went into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The delta was actually formed, and about 10% of it was in the river itself, where main stem aggradation and gravel bar development and wood accumulation occurred. Adult cell monitors are making it past both of the dam sites, and we've seen quite a few reds in the middle air, in the middle uh, reach. And salmon are adapting to the local environmental conditions and the difference in life history types. And we're also seeing non salmonid species increasing in numbers. And in terms of benthic inverts, we saw a dramatic reduction um, followed by an increase, and we saw a shift in what fish were eating, and we're seeing benefits from animals such as American dippers um, in terms of their behavior and what they're doing. So with that, sorry I'm going over, but thank you.